But for those of you who are holding a family Thanksgiving, I'm going to provide you with plenty of material to ruin your family's holiday uh, today. Um, I am, of course, perfectly aware that some of you can ruin your family's holiday without an assist from me. Uh, but I'll give you even more material with which to work uh, in this talk. I also want to note that it, it might be jarring to some members of this audience to hear me use the word Indians in this talk tonight and to see it in my book title. We should all know Indians is a misnomer propagated by Europeans because, right, well, I can't assume this given that we're all here remotely, but you know, I'm, my assumption is that we're, none of us are in India. Now, in recent decades, of course, some people have substituted the term Native Americans for Indians in a justifiable effort to be more accurate and racially sensitive. So let me explain why I have decided to use this term to the extent that I do. For the better part of, of 25 years, I've been conducting historical research on America's indigenous people. And that research has always involved outreach to the descendant communities whose ancestors I'm writing about. And in the context of, of those years of interactions with indigenous people, really all across the, the continent, I've learned that most of them, certainly not all of them, but most of them prefer the term Indian when referring to them in the aggregate. In other words, over the generations, they've appropriated this term and made it a point of pride. Now, I should also emphasize that almost to a person, they prefer tribal names when appropriate. And so I strive to use tribal names uh, when, when I can. Point is that it's out of deference to indigenous people, not indifference that I, that I occasionally use this word. I also wanna emphasize that though my book and the talk here tonight focuses on historical Wampanoag people and strives to include their voices at every turn, if my surname didn't give it away, you should know I'm not Wampanoag. And this is not a history that's told from a modern Wampanoag perspective. To be sure, my conversations with modern Wampanoag people have informed the content. And indeed, the, the reason I decided to write this book, and I'll touch on this theme later, was because I, I heard from Wampanoag people directly how hard Thanksgiving season was for them every single year, and particularly how hard it was for their kids in school. But there's material in this book and in this talk that some Wampanoag people will consider dubious, outright wrong, and even none of my business as an outsider. Now, I've done my best to weigh those criticisms in advance by soliciting responses to drafts of this book from historically minded friends and colleagues in the Wampanoag community. I shared work, this book is a work in progress with several Wampanoag audiences along the way. I even shadowed the Wampanoag staff at Plymouth Plantation the week before Thanksgiving, um, before I finished uh, my first draft of, of the book. Along the way, I offered to include dissenting opinions from Wampanoag people alongside my own, all the while acknowledging that the, the playing field's uneven because I'm, I'm the author. Ultimately, all the editorial decisions in this talk and in this book belong to me alone. And in the final analysis, I've had to make some really hard choices based on the standards of my discipline of history. And I should emphasize, if the point uh, isn't clear by the time I'm done, uh, let me emphasize it now. Honest history, truthful, unvarnished history is hard on people. It's hard on everybody. Um, and that's certainly true of the material that we'll be covering tonight. I want to urge all of you uh, here and any of anyone else who reads this book to seek out the Wampanoag's own interpretations of, of this history. They're widely available in print and film, uh, on, and certainly online. All you have to do is uh, Google Wampanoag history, Thanksgiving, and plenty of examples of Wampanoag people sharing their opinions on this story um, will, will enter your computer. My hope is, with all of these caveats, that Wampanoag people, other indigenous people, and all of you uh, will see a, an informed and well-intentioned attempt to fulfill the Indian call, to take Indian history seriously within the context of a greater American history. So with all of those preliminaries, let's begin. Now for generations, Americans have been telling themselves a patriotic story of the supposed first Thanksgiving 
that treats colonization as a consensual bloodless affair. In this tale, the pilgrims, religious dissenters from England, cram aboard the Mayflower to brave the stormy Atlantic in search of freedom of conscience in America. And you know the story. These sea-tossed adventurers land off Cape Cod with a fresh copy of their proto-constitution, the Mayflower Compact, and after some fruitless exploring and brief contacts with the natives, decide to found their settlement up the coast at a place they call Plymouth. Yet the future of the colony is very much in doubt during its first couple of months because the Indians, rarely identified by tribe in traditional tellings of this story, on whom the English know they must depend for food and protection, seem to be at best wary and shy, and at worst, hostile. However, eventually the natives reach out to the newcomers through the interpreters Samoset and Squanto. The traditional story sidesteps the obvious question of how these figures managed to learn English, nor does it explain why the Indians suddenly became so friendly. The native's chief, his name was Usamequin. Most of us know him by his title, Massasoit. That's like when we call the president, Mr. President. It's not his real name, it's his title, right? But Usamequin even agrees to a treaty of alliance with Plymouth. Over the spring and summer, the natives feed the pilgrims and teach them how to plant corn and where to fish. And with this, the colony begins to thrive. That fall, after the English bring in their first successful harvest, the two parties seal their friendship with the famous first Thanksgiving. The peace that follows permits colonial New England, and by extension, all of modern America to become blessed, blessed seats of freedom, democracy, Christianity, and plenty. As for what happens to the Indians next, this story has nothing to say. The Indians' legacy, according to traditional Thanksgiving stories, is to present America as a gift to white people, or in other words, to concede to colonialism. Like Pocahontas and Sacagawea, the other famous Indians of early American history, they help the colonizers and then move off stage. Over the generations, white Americans love native people who helped. The Wampanoags of what is now southeastern Massachusetts, who are the Indians in this drama, have long contended that this tale is not history, but a myth that sugarcoats the viciousness of colonialism for indigenous people. My book reckons with this uncomfortable assertion and its implications. For instance, in traditional accounts of Thanksgiving, the pilgrims step onto Plymouth Rock and into a new world or wilderness, when in fact, human civilization in the Americas was every bit as rich and ancient as in Europe, or for that matter, anywhere else on the globe. History didn't begin for the Wampanoags with the Mayflower. They already had a dynamic past, countless generations old, that shaped who they were and what they did including their response to the English. In other words, they inhabited an old world. And the so-called wilderness in which the English arrived was full of villages, roads, cornfields, historic monuments, cemeteries, and forests cleared of underbrush, all by Indian design. And you can see some evidence of this in the drawing that appears here. Now, this is a drawing of the Wampanoag community of Patuxet, right on the site where Plymouth would later be founded. And it was drawn by the French explorer Samuel de Champlain in 1605, 15 years before the pilgrims arrival. If you're struggling to interpret what you're seeing here. These are cornfields here. And these are Wetus or wigwams, uh, Wampanoag houses with, with smoke coming out of the, uh, the chimneys. So the Wampanoag's ancient history matters to understanding the context in which the first Thanksgiving took place. And it's not just ancient history, but the Wampanoag's re recent history that mattered too. 
Though the Thanksgiving myths suggest that the Pilgrim Wampanoag encounter was a first contact episode. In fact, it was just one in a long string of bloody meetings between Wampanoags and Europeans from 1524 onward, at least 15 first documented case of contact. There might've been others before that. And particularly from 1602 onward, these contacts became annual affairs. There would be several episodes where Europeans and Wampanoags met every single summer. And the context of those contacts is uh, suggested by yet another drawing by Samuel de Champlain. The Thanksgiving myth portrays the Wampanoags as timid and overawed by the pilgrims. But I show that the Wampanoags were easily the stronger party during Plymouth's early years. They, um, they outnumbered the colonists of Plymouth uh, by a factor of more than 20. The English did not dictate to the Wampanoags. Instead, the Wampanoags initially used Plymouth Colony as a pawn in their domestic tribal and intertribal politics. I think it will come as a surprise to most of my readers that the celebrated first Thanksgiving feast actually played a minor role in this relationship. It was practically a non-event to the historical actors. Far more influential in shaping this alliance were a series of other less palatable episodes filled with violence and power politics. I also submit that our emphasis on the nearly 50 years of peace following the first Thanksgiving and its associated treaty of 1621 elides the more important point. And that is that the Wampanoags came to resent the colonists aggressive and often underhanded expansion. The truth is that the English and the Wampanoags nearly came to blows repeatedly during that supposed long peace. And particularly after the death of Usamequin, again, or Massasoit in 1660, culminating in the terrible King Philip's War of 1675. 76. Most histories that bother to include the Wampanoags end with this war. The implication being that after that, they disappeared. But my book contends that accounting with the, the Thanksgiving myth as a white lie requires tracing Wampanoag struggles with colonialism through the centuries right up to the present day. And I think this perspective is essentially, is, is, is particularly essential as modern America struggles with new manifestations of white nationalism. While at the very same time, indigenous Americans in New England and indeed all across the country are reasserting their political, economic and cultural sovereignty. We need long-term historical perspectives to understand these sorts of developments. So to explore these themes and bring Wampanoag voices to the foreground, I'm gonna focus this talk around three cases spread across the centuries in which Wampanoags or other native people affiliated with them post counter narratives to white people's triumphalist histories. Our first revisionist historian is none other than the Wampanoag sachem or chief Pometacom, better known to history as King Philip. Some of you might also know him as Metacom or Metacomet. In the late spring of 1675, 50 years after his father, Usamequin or Massasoit, had greeted the pilgrims, Pometacom sat down to talk with the delegation of magistrates from the colony of Rhode Island. So here's Wampanoag country. And this is where the talk took place, right here at Montauk. The Rhode Islanders were there to encourage the sachem to agree to a peaceful arbitration of the Wampanoag's mounting tensions with Plymouth Colony. Yet I, arg I argue that Pometacom had already resolved to fight and agreed to this conference only to explain why. Let's take a moment to consider what he said that day. And by the way, uh, we're lucky to be able to recount this, uh, this conversation the leading magistrate of the Rhode Island delegation, John Easton, he's the Lieutenant Governor of Rhode Island. He could speak Wampanoag. 
And this conversation certainly took place in Wampanoag, given that it took place in Wampanoag territory. Um, to be sure, Pometacom wouldn't uh, lower himself to speak English in his own country. Uh, and Easton recorded this conversation. Um, we, we don't know quite how accurate, um, but as you will see, Pometacom had a lot of things that the English weren't all that eager to hear. Now in this conversation, Pometacom made it clear that he viewed the history of Wampanoag English relations as little more than the colonists' failure to live up to the promise of the 1621 alliance. The sachem recalled that when the pilgrims first settled at Plymouth, more than a half century earlier, his father, Usamequin, and I quote here, was as a great man and the English as a little child. Remember that metaphor. Usamequin was a great man and the English were a little child, where it was a little child. Now, Pometacom contended, and he was right, that Usamequin could have wiped out the infant colony if he had wished. And here, by the way, you see Usamequin's mark on an English land deed. Instead, Usamequin held back Plymouth Colony's many native enemies, fed the starving colonists, and granted them land. Now, Pometacom conveniently left out that his father had made this choice less out of altruism than a desperate need for allies. For the Wampanoags had been hobbled by a terrible plague between 1616 and 1619. We don't know what the identity of the plague was. It was certainly introduced by Europeans. It was probably smallpox, that's my best guess. All we know is that European contemporaries called it a plague, which could mean any disease. But the point is, Wampanoags had been depopulated somewhere between 50% and 90% of their population, but their Narragansett enemies to the West had been spared the disease. And the Narragansetts took advantage of that, that new balance of power to try reducing their Wampanoag rivals to the status of tributaries. So Usamequin and the Wampanoags need help and fast. Pometacom also overlooked his father's desire to become the point man in trade with the English in order to consolidate his authority over the loose Wampanoag polity. But Pometacom was absolutely correct that Plymouth would have become yet another English lost colony, and there were many of in this period, if it had not been for Wampanoag largesse. And how did Plymouth show its gratitude decades later, now that it had become the great man? Well, Pometacom, and you can see his mark here, Keep in mind the English call him Philip. Pometacom cited the example that in 1662, Plymouth had seized and he alleged fatally poisoned his brother Wamsutta or Alexander because the English feared that he was plotting an anti-colonial league. More recently, the English had used Christian Indian testimony to arrest, try and execute three of Pometacom's men for the supposed murder of another Christian Indian, John Sassaman, who had been leaking Wampanoag intelligence to colonial authorities. To Pometacom, Plymouth Colony's executions of the, of the Sassaman murderers and its presumed assassination of his brother Wamsutta were bad enough as discrete events. But worse still, they crystallized a vast array of English wrongs. Pometacom denounced that in English courts, and I quote here, if 20 honest Indians testified that an Englishman had done them wrong, it was as nothing. But if one of their worst Indians testified against any Indian suspected by the English, that was sufficient. Furthermore, the English had begun to interfere in criminal matters between Wampanoag people within Wampanoag territory. Pometacom railed, and I quote again, that whatever was only between Indians and not in English townships, they would not have us prosecute. About half of the Wampanoags, mostly on Cape Cod and the islands of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket had adopted Christianity and sworn off Pometacom's leadership, as well as the responsibility to pay him tribute. And they feared no reprisal from the sachem 
because they enjoyed English protection by virtue of their Christianity. By the way, what you're looking at here, this is, the, is a page from the first Bible ever published in North America. Note, it's in the Wampanoag language. Hot off the press uh, from Harvard, uh, Harvard College Press. What you're seeing here, these, this is marginalia. Uh, so, you know, writing in the margins of these Wampanoag Bibles by Wampanoag people in their own language. Uh, Wampanoag was not a written language when the English arrived, uh, but when, when uh, the mission started, when the English started launching Christian missions to Wampanoag people, English missionaries and Wampanoag people together worked to put the, the Wampanoag language to an alphabet and created this system of literacy with which Wampanoag people engaged the Bible. The point for Pometacom was that Christianity cut into his political authority. It led Wampanoag communities to break away from his rule and cut off tribute payments to him. And there were other issues too. The English used land deeds, some fair, some foul, to claim Wampanoag territory for their own exclusive use under their own exclusive jurisdiction. Well, this ran contrary to the natives' expectation that their land sales merely conveyed permission to the English to settle among them, not to buy the land from out under them, but rather for the English to become part of Wampanoag society. Imagine if Wampanoags crossed the Atlantic and moved to England. They bought land there, they would be buying into English society, right? Wampanoags have the same expectation. When Indians resisted, colonists flooded the contested tracks with livestock and slapped any Indians who injured the animals with trumped up criminal fines and lawsuits. The point was to force holdout natives to release their claims and resign themselves to the English interpretations of these sales. Such machinations, and they were constant, gave the colonists, as Pometacom put it, 100 times more land than now the king Pometacon meant himself, had for his people. To the Wampanoags then, English law was but a shakedown by people with short memories and thin loyalty. Given these patterns, Pometacom asked rhetorically, why would he put any faith in the negotiated settlement proposed by Rhode Island? History taught that the English would just use some technical violation as an excuse to confiscate his land or even to kill him. The Rhode Islanders, seeing where this conversation was headed, cautioned Pometacom that it would be suicidal for the Wampanoags to resort to arms because they said the English were too strong for them. And I love this retort. Hitchum's response was, then the English should do to them, the Wampanoags, as they did when they were too strong for the English. In other words, he called on the colonists to assume the role of the great man by acting with generosity, restraint, and justice towards the Wampanoags who over the decades had become the little child. And that's where the conference ended because everyone knew this wish was futile. Just days later, Pometacom led a Wampanoag force against nearby English towns, prompting a war that would engulf the entire region and ultimately break the back of native power in Southern New England. This terrible war is the most basic feature of the Wampanoag English relationship that the Thanksgiving myth studiously ignores. Initially, Wampanoag resistance fighters got the best of it by repeatedly sacking exposed English settlements and ambushing troops on the march. Furthermore, Soon they had the support of the Nipmucks of central Massachusetts, the Narragansetts of what's now Rhode Island, the Pocumtucks and Sokokis of the Connecticut River Valley, whom colonists turned into enemies by repeatedly violating their neutrality, such as attempting to confiscate their weapons or forcing them to turn over Wampanoag non-combatants who had taken refuge with them. The English then made things even worse for themselves by treating the thousands of Christian Indians 
who pledged fealty to the colonies from the beginning as wolves in sheep's clothing or as a fifth column. Massachusetts and Plymouth herded Christian Indians into island concentration camps where the people suffered malnutrition and exposure. Well, for the warring Indians, this was a plus. They took advantage of these colonial missteps to accumulate victories in which they claimed the lives of upwards of 3,000 Englishmen, destroyed 16 colonial towns, and slaughtered 800 head of cattle. Eventually, however, the resistance collapsed in no small part because other native people threw in their lot with the English. And I'll call your attention uh, to this area right here. In February of 1676, the Mohawks of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois League, as a gesture of alliance to the young English colony of New York, drove Pometacom's winter camp away from Dutch and French gun markets on the Hudson River and eastward back into the teeth of New England forces. Also lying in wait among the English were the Mohegans and Pequots of Connecticut and Christian Wampanoags of Cape Cod, who under duress had sided with the colonies from the beginning and were just as adept in forest warfare as the resistance fighters. Meanwhile, the warring Indians and their families were stalked by hunger, and disease as they lived in cramped quarters on the run, away from their cornfields and fishing stations. Consequently, by the late spring of 1676, growing numbers of them had decided to accept the late English offer of quarter in exchange for switching sides. Others managed to avoid this terrible fate by escaping to the upper Hudson River Valley or Canada where they built new lives, but most of them never made it that far. Um, because you're in the Hudson River Valley, <laughs> you'll understand um, where I'm talking about. The community of Skashtokok uh, near Albany began as a multi-tribal settlement of refugees from Southern New England escaping this war. By June, 1676, Native prisoners were telling their English captors that Pabeticom, and I quote, was ready to die, for you have now killed or taken all his relations and almost broke his heart. Those relations included his wife, Watuna Kanuski, and their son, but we don't know his name, who colonists captured and sold into the horrors of Caribbean slavery. They were but two of an estimated 2,000 Indians men, women, and children alike, who the English sentenced to slavery in this war. And not only in New England, but as far away as the West Indies, Gibraltar, and Tangier. Some of these poor souls had surrendered based on English promises of mercy, only to discover that the terms were harsher than colonial authorities had pledged. Worse still, some surrendering natives learned too late that colonial officials would not spare any native person who they suspected of having taken an English life. And by the way, their standards in making these judgments weren't uh, particularly scrupulous. Massachusetts, Plymouth and Rhode Island held public executions throughout the summer and fall of 1676, including 50 hangings on Boston Common alone. By the way, Boston Common today makes no mention of this event. The English even exacted retribution on the dead. On August 6, colonial forces discovered the drowned body of Wiedemu, a female sachem and war leader, and the sister of Pometacom's wife. Authorities ordered her head to be severed and piked next to a holding pen full of Wampanoag prisoners. The captives, according to English accounts, made a most horrid and diabolical lamentation, crying out, it was their queen's head. A few days after this incident, Pometacom was dead too, shot down by a Christian Indian, the English called Alderman. Filled with a vengeful spirit, Captain Benjamin Church had the sachem dismembered and his head sent to Plymouth. There, 
on the very site where the sachem's father had feasted and allied with the English. In the first Thanksgiving, authorities mounted their grizzly trophy outside the town gate and left it there to rot for the next 20 years. It's likely one of the last things that Pometacon's wife saw when Plymouth shipped her from her homeland into slavery. Later that week, Plymouth held the day of Thanksgiving in praise of God for saving the colony from its enemies. I, I think we can all agree. These horrors are as contrary to the traditional Thanksgiving story as it gets. Though history rarely pays attention to the Wampanoags after King Philip's War, my book emphasizes that this conflict was just the first stage in a centuries long battle to defend their land and sovereignty. It should come as no surprise to any of us that the English seized nearly all of the Wampanoag's territory in the decades after the war, leaving only a handful of town-sized reservations for mostly Christian natives. Please note that I didn't frame this process as the Wampanoags losing their land. I hate that term. As if by mistake. No, no, no. Colonists and their successors took it. The English also seized the Wampanoags as bound laborers. From the late 1600s through the mid 1800s, white merchant creditors, courts and government appointed guardians colluded to force the Wampanoags and their children into indentured servitude to white farmers, householders and whaling merchants. The terms often lasted for several years and even decades. One of my colleagues in the field, Margaret Newell of Ohio State University, contends that we should call this judicial slavery. And I, I think she's right. Well, such debt peonage and court ordered bondage made it nearly impossible for the Wampanoags to sustain their normal social patterns, including the process of raising their own children to the point that few Wampanoags could speak their ancestral language by the mid 1800s. Enter William Apis, the Pequot born preacher to the community of Mashpee, the Wampanoag community of Mashpee on Cape Cod. And he'll be our second native figure after Pometacom to dispute white American self-serving sanitized histories. In 1836, Apis wrote his eulogy on King Philip. And by the way, he delivered it in Boston to a packed house of white people. And in it, he used a revisionist account of the Pilgrim Saga to call attention to the plight of indigenous people. And let's keep in mind, you know, when, when he's uh, giving this talk to a white audience, we're right in the middle of Jacksonian Indian removal. So native people are a really hot topic and Northeastern, uh, Northeastern people were overwhelmingly opposed to Jackson's policy. So you know, he has a receptive audience here. Now in this talk, Apis argued that native people were the real heroes of Plymouth's founding because they comported themselves like model Christians, whereas the supposedly saintly pilgrims behaved like villains and hypocrites. Apis meticulously laid out how the pilgrims had introduced themselves to the Wampanoags by desecrating their graves and looting their corn, then had the audacity to turn to Usamequin for help. Yet the chief, to his moral credit, obliged, like a true Christian, imbued with the principles of charity and forgiveness. No people could be used better than they were, Apis intoned. The Wampanoags gave the English venison and sold them many hogsheads of corn. Had it not been for this humane act of the Indians, every white man would have been swept away from the New England colonies. Apis also contended that Massasoit's son, Pometacom, was, and I quote, the greatest man that ever lived upon American shores. Apis ranked him even higher than my university's namesake, George Washington, because the sachem fought against a darker tyranny and for greater freedom with far fewer means at his disposal. In Apis's telling, Pometacom was no misguided hothead for taking up arms against colonial dominance. Rather, 
He was a sage because he foresaw, and I quote again, that the white people would not only cut down their groves, but would enslave them. And how true the prophecy, our groves and hunting grounds are gone, our dead are dug up, our council fires are put out. It was all an outgrowth, as Apis framed it, of a fire, a canker, created by the pilgrims from across the Atlantic to burn and destroy my poor unfortunate brethren. In light of this sordid history, Apis proposed that Indians should treat each December 22nd, the anniversary of the pilgrims landing in Plymouth, and every 4th of July as, and I quote, days of mourning and not joy. Let them rather fast and pray to the great spirit, the Indians God, who deals out mercy to his red children and not destruction. This call by Apis for native people to commemorate that they bore the burden of white America's triumphs would continue to resonate with the Wampanoags long after he was gone. Less than 40 years later, in the late 1860s and 1870s, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts addressed the stubborn refusal of the Wampanoags to disappear by dissolving their reservations of Mashpee Herring Pond, Gayhead or Aquina, Christiantown, Chappaquiddick, and several others. The state divided the common lands of these places into private property tracts, subjected those lands to taxation and confiscation for debt, and declared the inhabitants to be full-fledged citizens and no longer Indians, as if the two were antithetical. White officials congratulated themselves that in this, they had bestowed legal equality on native people, just as New Englanders were pressuring white Southerners to do with black freedmen and women under reconstruction. And in their, in their mind, justice for native people and justice for African-Americans was the same thing. Or it's not the same thing. And I, should, I think it's worth stepping aside here to emphasize this point. For African-Americans, like most American minorities, justice means equal treatment under the law. For native people, being absorbed by the American polity means that they've been conquered. For them, sovereignty is what justice is all about. The right to self-rule, the right to their own territory and their own governance. Well, in this particular case, White officials in Massachusetts refused to listen to Wampanoags who protested that this supposed gift of citizenship was really just a Trojan horse to rob them of their remaining land and force them to scatter. And that was indeed the, the point. White proponents of this measure at their more honest moments admitted that they considered the Wampanoags to be too racially intermixed to be classified as Indians any longer. And that in any case, it was the fate of Indians to vanish. And over the next century, white Americans did everything they could to make that supposedly natural process occur, including reducing Indians to romantic bit parts in the country's history, as exemplified in the Thanksgiving myth. Now, let me emphasize here, throughout the colonial era, Thanksgiving had no association whatsoever with pilgrims and Indians, none. The link between the holiday and the history dates to 1841, when the Reverend Alexander Young published a primary source account of a 1621 harvest feast hosted by Plymouth Colony and attended by 90 Wampanoag Indians. And here's the account, by the way, this is practically the entire primary source record of the first Thanksgiving. I mean, like, it really was a non-event. Now, to this account, Young added an influential footnote, which you see here. And take it from a, a professional historian, there aren't a lot of famous footnotes out there in, in history, but this is one of them. And this footnote read, this was the first Thanksgiving the harvest festival of New England. 
Well, over the next 50 years, various authors, artists, and lecturers, such as John Quincy Adams, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and the like, disseminated Young's idea until Americans took it for granted. Predictably, New Englanders were the first to tout the Pilgrims as national founders and their dinner with Indians as a template for Thanksgiving. But for the rest of the country to go along, the nation first had to subjugate the tribes of the Great Plains and far west. Only then could white people stop vilifying Indians as bloodthirsty savages and give them an unthreatening role in a national myth. The Pilgrim Saga also took hold at this time because it had use in the nation's culture wars. And yes, there were culture wars then, just as now. It was no coincidence that the Pilgrims emerged as founding fathers amid widespread anxiety that the US was being overrun by immigrants. Yes, then as now. In this particular case, Catholics from Ireland and Germany and later Jews and Orthodox Christians from Eastern Europe who were supposedly unappreciative of the country's Protestant democratic origins and values. Additionally, treating the pilgrims as the epitome of colonial America served to minimize the country's record of racial oppression, past and present. Better to highlight the pilgrims' religious and democratic principles instead of the Indian wars and slavery more typical of colonies, including those in New England. Through such means, Northeasterners could define the so-called Black and Indian problems as Southern and Western exceptions to an otherwise inspiring national heritage. So what I'm suggesting here is that though Americans eventually assumed that the Thanksgiving holiday had been associated with pilgrims and Indians since 1621, that tradition was a product of white Protestants in the mid to late 19th century, particularly Yankees, asserting their cultural authority over European immigrants, Americans of color, and other regions of the United States. This invention became tradition by the early 20th century and has remained so in no small part through American schools holding annual Thanksgiving pageants in which students dress up as pilgrims and Indians to reenact the first Thanksgiving. I'll admit, I myself remember participating in such a performance uh, as a youngster in which we sang, and I'm, I'm not going to oppose my singing on you, but we sang My Country Tis of Thee, in which we praised America as a sweet land of liberty and the pilgrims as my fathers, my fathers. The point of this exercise was to have a diverse group of school children learn about who we as Americans are, or at least who we're supposed to be. Even students from ethnic backgrounds would be instilled with the principles of representative government, liberty, and Christianity, while learning to identify with the English as fellow whites. Leaving Indians outside the category of my fathers also carried important lessons. It was yet another reminder about which race ran the country and whose values mattered. And lest we dismiss the impact of these messages, let's take a moment to consider the experience of a young Wampanoag woman who told me that when she was in grade school, the lone Indian in her class, her teacher cast her as chief Massasoit in one of these pageants and had her sing, this land is your land, this land is my land. Now, at the time she was just embarrassed, probably as much as by being cast as a man um, as anything else. But now as an adult, she sees the cruel irony in it. Other Wampanoags have told me about their parents objecting to these pageants and associated history lessons that the New England Indians were all gone only to have school officials question their claims to be Indian. Authentic Indians were supposed to be primitive relics frozen in some kind of stone age existence, not modern people. So what were they doing in school? Speaking English, wearing contemporary clothing and returning home to adults who had jobs 
and drove cars and shopped at the supermarket. By 1970, Frank James, the third in our sequence of native revisionist historians, had reached the limits of his patience with this nonsense. James was born and raised in the community of Aquina, or Gay Head on Martha's Vineyard, which had long ranked as one of the poorest communities in Massachusetts. Nevertheless, James grew up determined to succeed and represent his people. As a teenager, he even adopted the Wampanoag name Wamsutta, after the eldest son of Usamequin, who preceded Pometacom as brother in calling on the Wampanoags to resist colonialism. James's inner drive carried him all the way to the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston, where he studied trumpet, and then to the Nauset Regional Schools on Cape Cod, where he became director of music. Yet his passion was political activism and the study of Wampanoag history, because he understood that knowing the past was critical to reforming the present. And when he went to the primary sources, what he read made his blood boil because it bore little relation to the Thanksgiving myth that weighed around his people's neck like a millstone. So when James was invited to speak at a state banquet celebrating the 350th anniversary of Plymouth's founding, he saw it as a rare opportunity to set the story straight. Yet when he submitted a draft of his speech for review, state officials rejected it as too inflammatory. James, for his part, found an alternative script to be so childish and untrue that he pulled out of the event altogether. Instead, he drew up plans for a commemoration where there would be no censors. Inspired by the Red Power Movement for Indigenous Rights and Justice, James organized a National Day of Mourning to be held on Thanksgiving, 1970, at the site of the Massasoit statue overlooking Plymouth Rock. In choosing this name, James hearkened not only to the National Days of Mourning held after the assassinations of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King. He also reached back to Apis's eulogy on King Philip. Remember, Apis calling for native people to hold days of mourning. Well, like Apis incarnate, when James's moment came, he rose up before protesters from all across Indian country, media and onlookers, and delivered that inflammatory speech that Massachusetts had tried to suppress. He began with the poignant assertion that he had the right to the dignity of his humanity, despite society's efforts to diminish him and his people. I speak to you as a man, he stressed, a Wampanoag man. I'm a proud man, proud of my ancestry, my accomplishments won by strict parental direction. Despite his family and his community suffering poverty and discrimination, two social and economic diseases. He acknowledged to his white listeners that Thanksgiving is a time of celebration for you, celebrating the beginnings of the white man in America. For James and the Wampanoags, however, the day had doleful implications. It is with a heavy heart, he explained, that I look back on what happened to my people. Like Apis, James proceeded to tell a history of English Wampanoag relations that turned the bedtime story of the Thanksgiving myth into a nightmare. His conclusion was that Usamequin's welcome of the pilgrims, and I quote, was perhaps our biggest mistake. We, the Wampanoags, welcomed you, the white man, with open arms little knowing that it was the beginning of the end, that before 50 years were to pass, the Wampanoag would no longer be a free people. To James, like Pometacom, like Apis, the moral of the first Thanksgiving was that the English and their white successors had betrayed the Wampanoags who befriended them in their time of need. And this is the message that has echoed through subsequent national days of mourning which the United American Indians of New England have continued to hold each Thanksgiving up to this very time. The question for all of us was and is how to move forward. 
Now, according to James, the answer is to confront this history, including the fact, as he put it, that the Wampanoags still walk the lands of Massachusetts. James also urged his fellow Americans to consider Indians as worthy of the same respect as everyone else. Let us remember, he counseled, the Indian is and was as human as the white man. The Indian feels pain, gets hurt, and becomes defensive, has dreams, bears tragedy and failure, suffers from loneliness, and needs to cry as well as laugh. If the American people followed his counsel to extend their Indian countrymen and women basic compassion and acknowledgement, it would make Thanksgiving Day 1970 a new beginning toward what James called a more humane America, a more Indian America, in which Native people could, and I quote again, regain the position in this country that is rightfully ours. There are so many reasons for Americans to follow James's lead and attempt to tell the history of Plymouth and Thanksgiving with three-dimensional Wampanoags at the center. Thanksgiving eclipses Columbus Day as a focal point for considering the Native American role in the nation's past. It's bad enough to have gotten the story so wrong for so long. It's downright inexcusable to continue the annual tradition of having teachers, politicians, and television producers traffic in the Thanksgiving myth, and residential homes and shopping centers sport decorations of happy pilgrims and Indians. These practices, and they're ubiquitous, dismiss Native people's real historical traumas at white hands in favor of depicting their ancestors as having consented to colonialism. To call the consequences harmless is to ignore the chorus of Native Americans, our fellow Americans, who say the hurt is profound, especially to their children. I think we can all agree this population has already suffered far more than its fair share in the creation of the United States. And I think it's worth emphasizing Native people have also contributed disproportionately to the military in every single one of the nation's wars, beginning with the revolution. In a pluralistic country, it's morally unacceptable to allow the celebration of a national holiday to damage part of the nation's people. Never mind the first people. Or for that matter, all of the people. Whereas the identity politics of marginalized groups tends to focus on achieving justice and equality, or in the Indian case, sovereignty as well, white identity politics has always centered on oppressing others. Yet there's been too little public reflection about how the Thanksgiving myth teaches white proprietorship of the nation. Why should a school-aged child with the name of, say, Silverman, identify more with pilgrims than Indians. After all, such a student is unlikely to descend from either group, and the descendants of both groups are Silverman's fellow Americans. If the student is taught to think of both pilgrims and Indians more dispassionately as they instead of we, which is to say like a historian does, it might be a step towards a more critical understanding of history in which all of the actors can be seen as more fully human with all the virtues and shortcomings that one would expect to find in any population. At the same time, if the student is taught to think of both groups more inclusively as we, with all of the associated risks of appropriation, it might be a step towards a more compassionate national culture. This vision would have school curriculums treat Native American history as basic to an understanding of American history in general, rather than just treating Native American history in November, in Native American History Month, let's integrate Native people who were most of the people for centuries, even after the European arrival, as part of the mainstream of the story. Such lessons would address the civilizations indigenous people created over thousands of years before the arrival of Europeans, the ways they have suffered under and resisted 
colonization and how they've managed to survive the apocalypse, make it through and adapt to modern life while maintaining their distinct identities and defending their indigenous rights. Units on American government would address the sovereignty of Indian tribes as a basic feature of American federalism. Such a shift might also represent bringing Indians and their concerns into the national conversation, including having presidential candidates hold serious discussions about their Indian policies and the state of Indian country, something I've never seen as an adult. If the public continues to associate Pilgrim Indian relations with Thanksgiving, the least we can do is get the story straight with Wampanoag actors and perspectives at the center. Imagine if instead of trafficking in the mythical Thanksgiving, we as a country reckoned with the story as told by Pometacom, William Apis and Frank James. I'm not naive. I realize the challenges are significant at several levels. Many Americans are uncomfortable with the Native American past. It tends to turn patriotic episodes inside out and villains or, and heroes into villains, or at least into deeply flawed heroes. It loosens white claims on morality and authority. It raises political and cultural questions about justice. It threatens to tear down monuments and rename buildings. But confronting this darkness also promises to shed light cultivate national humility, and most importantly, I think, signal to indigenous people that the country values them as us. As one gracious Aquina Wampanoag elder once told me, we do ourselves no good by hiding from the truth. And I think she was talking about all of us. Amen. <laughs>